Uh, thank you, Vitaly. Um, well, I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, it's good to see everyone again after the pandemic. I don't, most of you, I don't think I've, most of you who I know, I don't think I've seen since before. So anyway, uh, yeah. So let's talk about single recurrence, which is not as fashionable as multiple recurrence, but um, uh, how does it connect to, I, I should probably say, how does it connect to null potent structures? Well, the main question, questions about these things are in some sense, how is single recurrence controlled by the Kronecker factor or controlled by group rotations, which of course are at the lowest level of null potence. So uh, anyway, okay, uh, let's get started. So let's let's work in countable abelian groups and talk about uh, upper Bonnach density in countable abelian groups. And uh, if you have a set of positive upper Bonnach density, you want to understand the structure of the different set of, of this set. And uh, it turned out, it's been known for quite some time uh, that Bohr neighborhoods are closely related to the uh, sort of large scale structure of these different sets. So in general, in a countable abelian group, uh, you define a Bohr neighborhood by taking a by taking a d-dimensional torus, a homomorphism from your group into that torus, and an open neighborhood of the identity in the torus or the zero in the torus, and uh, your Bohr neighborhood is just what you get when you pull back that open neighborhood through the homomorphism. So these are easy to understand. It's easy to compute with Bohr neighborhoods. And uh, so they're natural things to look at in additive combinatorics. And Ulner proved, 1954, that if you have a set of positive upper bonic density in an abelian group, uh, and you look at the different set, of A, then that different set contains, almost contains a Bohr neighborhood. Uh, there's an exceptional, small exceptional set of zero Bonnach density. And uh, Bohr neighborhoods themselves have positive upper Bonnach density. So uh, this is non-trivial. This is telling you some structural information about the different set. And it would be great if you could eliminate the exceptional set because it's so easy to compute with Bohr sets. If you could eliminate that exceptional set, you would basically know everything about different sets, uh, sets of positive density. And uh, Ruja asked this question explicitly, uh, but I think the question was sort of around before then too. In any case, uh, so can you eliminate that set? And as a consequence of Krij's construction, Krij was actually answering a slightly different question. And I'll get to that in a bit. But Krij uh, proved that there is a set of positive upper bonic density in the integers whose different set does not contain a Bohr neighborhood of zero. And I want to emphasize sort of natural questions related to what's known. Uh, since we have examples like this, uh, I think it's a good idea to try to classify these examples. This problem, I am proposing that this is a good problem to work on. Uh, this may be, and I think this, this is probably out of reach with current methods, but it's worth thinking about anyway. Uh, but, oh, pardon me. So, Okay, there's Bohr neighborhoods of zero. Uh, Kreese's example does not eliminate the possibility that there's a Bohr neighborhood of some other number. So Bohr neighborhood of another number is just a translate of a Bohr neighborhood of zero. Uh, and so Ruja uh, and Ruja's co-authors and I uh, over the years have asked whether if you have a set of positive upper Bonnach density, uh, does it contain 
a poor neighborhood of something. And I constructed an example, a counter example. Uh, and this problem, I think, is, is closer to what's doable now. Maybe if I convince a bunch of you that this is a good problem to work on, we should make some progress. I mean, it's probably still very difficult, but I think it's worthwhile to try to classify the sets of positive upper bonnock density whose different set does not contain a Bohr neighborhood of any integer. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, Oh uh, yeah, so you want you want me to actually be careful about the quantifiers in these statements? Yeah. So uh right. So okay, first of all, upper bonic density, upper bonic density in the uh in a general group. Um do you want me to write down owner sequences? I mean just the supremum over, right? Supremum over uh, the density with respect to a Fulner sequence. Yeah, any Fulner sequence. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter which which specific Fulner sequence you you take. The other thing is, um, so for quantifiers, so uh, yeah, so for e the example here is for every D, uh, A minus A does not contain a Bohr neighborhood of rank D, right? It contains no Bohr neighborhood at all. So, okay, uh, and I want to try to I want to try to sort of explain the core uh, portion of these constructions. These constructions are all the same. So Chris's example and my example, I mean, somehow they're different in an, in an important way. But the sort of finite building blocks that show up in these are are all the same. Uh, and there's this finite model uh, that captures the combinatorics really well. So here's a finite analog. Um, so let's work in vector space over F2. You got your standard basis. E here is just the standard basis in F2 to the D. Subgroups in F2 to the D, which of course are also subspaces, uh, form the, uh, they play the role of Bohr neighborhoods. And so, the uh, sort of finite analog of Kreese's example is uh, if you fix K and delta less than one half, then for every sufficiently large D, uh, there is a subset in F2 to the D of density delta such that A minus A does not contain any coset of any subspace of co-dimension K. Is that right? Does that seem like a reasonable statement? Somehow when I, when I read it from here, it's harder to tell whether it makes sense on the screen. So anyway, okay. But uh, here's how you can try to construct such a thing, try to construct such an A. Uh, these examples will be defined as, this A will be defined as a certain kind of hamming ball. So you just, define the usual hamming weight of an element of F2 to the D, thinking of it as a string of zeros and ones. So W of X is the number of non-zero entries. Uh, the hamming ball of radius K around an element in F2 to the D is just all the points that differ from Y in at most K indices. And so uh, it, might be nice to observe that the Hamming ball of radius K around zero is zero together with the basis, together with the basis plus the basis and so on up to sums of K elements from the basis. Okay, so we're gonna use this to construct A. A will be actually be a Hamming ball of radius close to D over two. Okay. And so I claim that in F2 to the D, if you look at the Hamming ball of radius K around one, that 
hamming ball intersects every coset of every subspace of co-dimension k. And uh, when delta is less than one half uh, and d is large enough, the hamming ball of radius k around zero has density close to one half. And the difference set a k minus a k uh, is disjoint from this hamming ball around one. So together, one and three imply that a k minus a k, that difference set contains no subspace of co dimension k, because if a k minus a k did contain a subspace of co dimension k, then it would have non-empty intersection. That coset contained there would have non-empty intersection with the SK. So the AK minus AK would have non-empty intersection with the SK. So one and three together tell you that uh, AK minus AK does not contain a coset of a subspace of co-dimension K. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I, the, um, Statements two and three, I won't prove on the screen. I'll just say verbally, if you think about what the um, what these hamming balls are, this is all strings of zeros and ones with just under, where you're allowing just under uh, d over two many ones to appear in your string. So if you think of it in terms of random construction or coin flips, you can see, yeah or binomial estimates is probably the right way to look at this. Uh, your cardinality of this Hamming ball is gonna be really close to one half the ambient space. And, uh, oh, three, why three? Well, you can see if you subtract two elements in this Hamming ball, you get something in the Hamming ball. You, uh, you get something in the Hamming ball of radius d minus 2k around zero. And that's clearly disjoint. It's easy to check that's disjoint from uh, the Hamming ball of radius k around one. Okay, so uh, how do you prove one? I mean, it's kind of cute. Uh, so this property is translation invariant because we're talking about cosets here, right? Uh, so you can actually check that the same property is true for uh, the Hamming ball around zero. And meeting every coset of every co-dimension K subspace is the same as if uh, for every surjective homomorphism onto F2 to the K, rho of H of zero K is equal to F2 to the K. Right? If you meet every coset of a subgroup then your image in the quotient is everything, right? So, but that condition is easy to check because you know rho of E spans F2 to the K. And we also said on the previous slide, the Hamming ball of radius zero around K is just zero union E, union E plus E, and so on up to however many sums you're looking at. And so, uh, this, this row of E is a spanning set in F2 to the K because row is surjective and row of E spans F2, uh, uh, yeah, row is surjective and E spans F2 to the D. Uh, so you have a spanning set, row of E, and you've got the appropriate number of sums here to cover everything and F2 to the K. Make sense? Now you know the Krish example. <laughs> or you know the uh, um, important sort of combinatorial core of the Krish example. Everything I want to ask, everything I want to ask that I'll ask about recurrence properties is really asking some aspect of this question. Is there a fundamentally different way besides this is there a fundamentally, fundamentally different way to construct dense sets whose different sets 
lacks some prescribed structure. Anytime you see an example in the literature of a dense set whose different set does not contain this or that, it's probably based on this kind of construction. And uh, I don't know if you could, if you could classify, right? If you could classify the subsets of the dense subsets of uh, F2 to the K or F2 to the D whose different set does not contain a uh, coset of a subspace of co-dimension K, uh, you'd be doing, uh, you'd, you'd probably be able to answer most of the open questions about single recurrence. Okay, uh, so now I actually wanna go on and, yeah, now I wanna go on and talk about uh, Cass Nelson's problem. So the um, combinatorial version of Cass Nelson's problem which some people can squint really hard at this paper by Veach from 1968. Jonathan mentioned this, uh, uh, this paper in his many course talk, but uh, people say that uh, this question is in there. This question is explicitly in Landstat, uh, Ruja, Glasner, and Katz Nelson. It's now known as Katz Nelson's problem. Uh, and the question is, if you have a countable abelian group, and a syndetic subset of that group must uh, the different set contain a Bohr neighborhood of uh, a Bohr neighborhood of zero in the group? And the answer is unknown. Uh, there's no countable abelian group for which the answer is known. Uh, I'm going to look at. I'm going to try to look at some examples in uh, F3, the countable vector space over F3 and C if you can say anything interesting there. But anyway, um, these, these questions about different sets, of course, are related to uh, recurrence and dynamical systems. So the standard sort of correspondence principles uh, let you rephrase these questions about different sets in terms of uh, these return time sets. And so let's put up definitions about that. Okay, so. Uh, let's say we want to understand single recurrence in various categories of dynamical systems. So here's the standard definitions. Uh, a set, uh, let's see, if you have a countable abelian group and a subset of the group, you say it's a set of measurable recurrence. If for every measure preserving system and every set of positive measure in the system, there is a G in your set that brings the set of positive measure back to itself. Topological recurrence is the same, except now you're talking about minimal topological systems and open sets. And Bohr recurrence is the same, but now you're talking about minimal group rotations and uh, open sets in the phase space, open sets in the group. Okay. Uh, it's not completely obvious from this definition that measurable recurrence implies Bohr recurrence, but once you realize that uh, every, in a minimal system, every uh, invariant measure has full support, then you see this open set here has to have positive measures. So, uh, so you can see then that if S is a set of measurable recurrence, it has to be a set of topological recurrence. And if S is a set of topological recurrence, it has to be a set of Bohr recurrence. That's straightforward from the definition. And of course, the natural questions are, can you reverse these implications? Uh, the first explicit uh, question as to whether you could reverse this implication um, in this exact language was asked by Vitaly in uh, 85, I think. And, um, but it turns out Furstenberg had asked the same question in different language. And Ruja has, had asked the same question in different language. It wasn't realized until after the question was solved, I think, that these were all somehow the same question. Whether the second implication could be reversed is Katz Nelson's problem. Okay, uh, let's look at a couple of examples just for fun. Um, okay, so that's just the definition of measurable recurrence again. And so uh, if you have an infinite set 
then you know uh if you take all the differences uh the non-zero differences from that set that forms a set of measurable recurrence that's poincare's recurrence theorem um and uh, and the integer is of course probably the most famous example of a set of measurable recurrence and this kind of kicked off the study of sets of measurable recurrence as such the perfect squares are a set of measurable recurrence due to Furstenberg and Sharkozy. Uh, four end of the five halves is a set of measurable recurrence as well. I'm not sure exactly who is the first person to point this out. Bosher Nitsan, maybe? Probably known before. I don't know. Mate, was it you? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Anyway, uh, what's that? Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, non-examples. Uh, N squared plus one, not a set of measurable recurrence. It's not a set of more recurrence because it's not recurrent for the group rotation on four points. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see why N factorial is not a set of measurable recurrence, but it turns out there are circle rotations for which uh, N factorial is not a set of recurrence. So it's, it's really not a set of more recurrence either. Okay, um, and another way to phrase that same question I asked before uh, is, is there some common structure underlying all sets of measurable recurrence? The examples seem to be very different, right? If you look at all the known examples of sets of measurable recurrence, there doesn't seem to be any common structure apparent to all the examples, but um, I, I don't really have a, a feeling one way or the other about that, but it's sort of a useful perspective. And you can ask the same for other recurrence properties too. Okay. Um, so let me explicitly say what Kriege's example is about. Uh, so Kriege, uh, as I mentioned before, Bergelson, Furstberg, and Ruja asked all in different language uh, is every set of topological recurrence a set of measurable recurrence? And Kriege constructed an example of a set E, or no, just a set, uh, which is a set of topological recurrence um, and not a set of measurable recurrence. Uh, and actually, if you stare at his proof, you will realize that he actually proved this. If E is an infinite set, then in the integers, then there is a subset of E minus E, which is a set of topological recurrence, but not measurable recurrence. And that's interesting because you know this E minus E itself is a set of measurable recurrence. And that's one of the reasons this is interesting. Uh, this is only implicit in, in Kriege's, uh, Kriege's uh, original article, but it's, I, I have a preprint where this is explained explicitly. Uh, this, this preprint here, separating topological recurrence from measurable recurrence is essentially a rewrite of Kriege's original article. Uh, hopefully it's readable enough to understand Kriege's argument. Anyway, um, so now that you know, now that you know there's a set of topological but not measurable recurrence, you might wonder uh, what systems, what measure preserving systems can realize this, this kind of example. And so you might ask, uh, what can you say about an ergodic measure preserving system uh, admitting a set of positive measure uh, that never comes back to itself for every N in a set of topological recurrence, war recurrence? In other words, can you do the Kriege example where the non-measurable recurrence is realized by say, a distal system or by a weak mixing system. Um, seems kind of likely that if you have a set of topological recurrence, it also has to be a set of recurrence for distal systems. Uh, but I'm pretty sure you can do the Kriege example with a weak mixing system. So you can find a set of topological recurrence, which is not a set of measurable recurrence for some weak mixing system. 
uh, sort of a related question in that direction. Uh, can you prove that if you have a set which is a set of recurrence for every measurable system having zero entropy? So just restrict the definition of measurable recurrence to quantify only over systems of zero entropy. Is that set a set of actual measurable recurrence? Right. Of course, this is getting this is getting at uh, this sort of general idea of like what can you find a class easy to describe class of measure preserving systems that somehow captures all the information about what it means to be a set of recurrence. Okay, uh, now I'm getting at the the things I wanted to actually show you that I'm kind of excited about. Uh, yeah, measurable versus topological recurrence in other groups. So uh, I'll say FP omega is just the countably in infinite vector space over the field with P elements. Uh, it turns out Forrest actually constructed examples of topological but not measurable recurrence in F2 omega. And um, these examples can be lifted from subgroups and from quotients. So the Kriege example and Forrest example here uh, resolves this question about topological but not measurable recurrence uh, in a lot of groups. But it turns out whether you can do the Kriege example in F3 omega is still open. Um, Yes. So, yeah, I mean, it's that's, but that's an instance of what I was saying. All of these examples have the same sort of combinatorial core, but it is true. Uh, so, Horace example in F2 Omega is, is very, very much the same idea as, as Kriege's. But there's, there's still other technicalities. Of, there's a lot of technicalities left out of that finite example. And anyway, okay. Um, this, this, I think, is kind of an exciting problem. Uh, if you have a set of measurable recurrence, can you find a subset, which is a set of topological recurrence and not measurable recurrence? Now, I assert, and I will write up with Sohail the, uh, the, um, that this is true for the perfect squares, that uh, in the perfect squares, you can, you can do the Kriege example, essentially. Um, and other familiar explicit examples. Uh, but yeah, so in, um, I, I already have, as a consequence of a construction, uh, answering a problem, uh, a more intricate problem of uh, Nikos and Emmanuel and Mate. Um, as a side effect of that construction, I ended up with a, a subset of the perfect squares, which is a set of Bohr recurrence, but not measurable recurrence. So that's sort of strong evidence that you can do this. Uh, but for a completely arbitrary set of recurrence S, it, it seems very difficult uh, to answer this question. It's very hard to get your hands on subsets, recurrence properties and subsets of an arbitrary set of recurrence. Um, and you can ask the same thing, any, any other pair of recurrence properties you can ask, is there this sort of hereditary separation? Okay, um, so here's Katz Nelson's problem phrased in terms of recurrence. Uh, so, like I said, people believe, there are people who believe Beach asked this question in 1968, but uh, it was reiterated and now is known as Katz Nelson's problem. Okay, uh, so what's, what, what is, there, there has been some progress lately about Katz Nelson's problem. Uh, and I wanna say, um, Kunin and Rudin, as far as I know, were not aware of Katz Nelson's problem, did not write about recurrence, but they did prove in this paper called uh, Lacunarity and the Bohr Topology that if you have a lacunary subset of the integers and a subset of its different set, which is a set of Bohr recurrence, then S is actually a set of topological recurrence. Um, so that's already a non-trivial fact about 
for recurrence and, and topological recurrence because uh, we know this E minus E here is a, uh, it, it itself is a set of measurable recurrence. And we know Frege's construction tells us that it contains a set of topological but not measurable recurrence. So this, this statement here is not completely trivial and seems to be saying something interesting, but yeah. Oh, well, okay. One's like, mm -hmm. uh, so Lacunar in a general abelian group. So the, the real secret structure here uh, is that Lacunar sets are I zero sets. An I zero set in the integers is one where every bounded function can be uh, uniformly approximated by a trigonometric polynomial. And so uh, that, that can be defined in any, and exists in any countable abelian group. So uh, that's really what they proved. They, they didn't state, state, for some reason they said lacunary, but they talk about I zero sets in the paper and they really prove this for, I mean, they really proved this. I just wrote it up uh, in the language of recurrence in this uh, paper in 2023. Anyway, yeah, does, does that make sense? But yeah, so it's, it's about I zero sets somehow. If you could extend it to C, if you could, if you could replace I zero here with C dot, then you would know it or you would know the whole conjecture. Anyway, um, okay. Uh, in terms of um, special dynamical systems, uh, Host, Kra, and Moss prove that if S is a set of Bohr recurrence, uh, then S is a set of topological recurrence for minimal nil systems. But if I understand right, you actually get measurable recurrence. Is that right? For nil systems. So that's interesting. And um, Florian and Andreas and Daniel Glasscock in this survey, they, um, they proved that if S is a set of four recurrence for, uh, oh yeah, if S is just a set of four recurrence, then S is a set of recurrence for a special class of minimal skew product systems instead of topological recurrence, I should say there. Um, and so these things are all evidence that the statement, right, every set of topological, uh, every set of Bohr recurrence is a set of topological recurrence is true, but uh, I'd say it's not strong evidence. I don't know. Um, this is a really nice survey. This, this sort of survey is like the whole history of Cass Nelson's problem. I highly recommend it. Okay, uh, so I wanna give an ex some explicit examples of sets of Bohr recurrence where I don't know whether they're sets of topological recurrence or sets of measurable recurrence. And so I wanna do this in uh, countable direct sum of Z mod three Z. Uh, but let's, um, let me just reiterate the uh, definition of Bohr neighborhood here. So you get a Bohr neighborhood by taking a homomorphism into T to the D and looking at an open set around zero and T to the D. And you look at all the G, all the elements of your group that are mapped into that neighborhood. That's your Bohr neighborhood of zero. And it's easy to check that S is a Bohr, oops. It's easy to check that S is a Bohr neighborhood of zero if and only if uh, S intersects, or sorry, S is a set of Bohr recurrence if and only if S intersects every Bohr neighborhood of zero. Uh, and so if you're working in a group, uh, a torsion group, like countable direct sum of Z mod PZ, then uh, the Bohr neighborhoods of zero are exactly the finite index subgroups because, well, when you have a, uh, one of these groups, the image, all the uh, elements in this group have order P, let's just say P is prime. Uh, all the uh, elements of the group have order P, so all the elements in the image have order P. There's only finitely many uh, elements of order P in the, to in the D dimensional torus. So you're really looking at, when you look at these homomorphisms, you're really looking at a homomorphism into a finite group. So the Bohr neighborhoods of zero are just, the finite index subgroups. 
in FP Omega. Okay. And so what does this mean for being a set of Bohr recurrence in FP Omega? Well, another way to say it is if S in FP Omega is a set of Bohr recurrence, if for every D and N and every homomorphism from FP Omega into a finite group, there exists a G where rho of G is equal to zero and G and S where rho of Z, G is equal to zero. So you can sort of forget about the, the neighborhood. You're just going straight to zero in the definition of Bohr neighborhood for these groups. Okay, so again, we'll uh, set up the standard basis E1, E2, E3 in F3 omega. Um, well, script E will be that basis. And it's not a set of Bohr recurrence because there is a homomorphism from F3 omega to F3 that keeps the image of E away from zero, just the sum, the homomorphism defined by taking the sum of the coordinates that maps the standard basis to one, not to zero. So that's not a set of Bohr recurrence. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at elements of Hamming weight three, in other words, you look at elements with um, ones and three entries and zeros everywhere else, uh, the set of such things forms a set of Bohr recurrence in F3 omega. And you can just pigeonhole to see why that is. So if you take a homomorphism from F3 omega to a finite group, you can just choose i, j, and k so that rho of e, i, and rho of e, j, and rho of e, k are all the same. And then rho of EI plus EJ plus EK, uh, what is that? That's rho of EI plus rho of EJ plus rho of EK. That's three rho of EI because I said these are all the same. So that's just zero and characteristic three. And this EI plus EJ plus EK, I should say choose IJ and K distinct naturally. And this EI plus EJ plus EK is, of course, an E3. So that checks that your E3 is a set of Bohr recurrence. Uh, now you might wonder uh, which subsets of E3, which subsets of E3 are sets of Bohr recurrence. Yeah. No, I mean, this is the most interesting part of the talk. So I figured I'd give you a second to think about it. Okay, so uh, but to answer this question, we'll say, um, let's look at a collection of subsets of the natural numbers. We'll say F is partition regular. If for every partition of the natural numbers, there is an element of the collection contained in one cell of the partition. Uh, and now you can sort of see that this is relevant to this pigeonholing idea here. So uh, if you basically repeat the pigeonholing argument with the definition of partition regularity in mind, you get this characterization of Bohr recurrence for subsets of E3. So if F is a collection of three elements of subsets of N, and of course, these can be used to parameterize the subsets of E3. Uh, if F is a collection of three element subsets of the natural numbers, I'll just say EF is the... Uh, things you get by adding up the corresponding basis vectors from indices in the elements of the collection. Uh, this is a set of Bohr recurrence in F3 omega, if and only if the collection F is partition regular. So, oh, sorry. So um, that means you can look at lots and lots of examples of sets of Bohr recurrence who are these people? Uh, so um, Ken Kunin is a big time set theorist you've probably heard of, um, but he did some work in harmonic analysis and Givens uh, was his PhD student. Uh, she did this in her thesis and they co-authored a paper about this. They were studying the question of, if you look at uh, the Bohr topology on two different groups, are those uh, on two different countable groups, uh, are those, uh, topologies homeomorphic as topological spaces, and that's why they're interested in this. Anyway, um, 
So of course you can look at this set. I'll say this. You can look at this set as sub three AP, right? Just all the things with ones appearing evenly spaced in F3 omega. Or you can look at the corresponding configurations for sure triples. And these things, this S sub 3 AP is a set of Bohr recurrence in F3 omega. Is it a set of topological recurrence? If not, that answers Katzelson's problem in F F3 omega. Uh, is it a set of measurable recurrence? Well, if, if S sub 3 AP is a set of topological recurrence, but not a set of measurable recurrence, then I think that's, that's something that separates topological recurrence from measurable recurrence in a way that's fundamentally different from the Krige example. That answer, that would, I think this would answer that question. Of can you find a fundamentally different way of constructing dense sets whose different sets like structure? Anyway, so the other reason these, it's interesting to look at this E3 set is because it turns out uh, if you resolve Katz Nelson's problem for subsets of E3, you have resolved it in general. So I proved in this, this paper, it's in Monet Sheft, I guess. Um, if every subset of E3, which is a set of Bohr recurrence, is also a set of topological recurrence, then every subset of F3 omega, which is a set of Bohr recurrence, uh, is a set of topological recurrence. So if you want to resolve Katznelson's problem in F3 omega, you need only look at subsets of E3. And so somehow these, these kinds of things are interesting. I have no idea. I've not been able to resolve this for any, uh, I've not been able to resolve this for any non-trivial example. E3 itself is actually a set of measurable recurrence, but the proof of that isn't terribly interesting. So, um, okay, Here, uh, here's one more example that appeared at one point. Um, so uh, Nikos and Randall McCutcheon asserted that this set is a set of four recurrence. Uh, I, I don't know a proof myself, but um, in any case, it's, this is an interesting question. So K factorial times two to the N times three to the M, this could be it. This could be an example of a set of four recurrence that's not a set of topological recurrence, or it could have some other interesting recurrence properties. I don't know. Okay. Um, I only have, what, one minute? I'll take a minute. Um, okay. Uh, no, I won't. I'm going to stop there. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so so Bohr recurrence, if you want to think of it in terms of different sets, uh, S is a set of Bohr recurrence. If for every Bohr neighborhood of an integer in, or whatever, yeah, Bohr neighborhood of an integer, uh, the different set of that Bohr neighborhood intersects S. So the the usual definition of um, Bohr recurrence uh, is somehow the same as talking about different sets. And it's just different sets aren't, are usually not mentioned in the definition because every, every Bohr neighborhood of zero contains a different set of a Bohr neighborhood. So when you're talking about Bohr neighborhoods of zero, you really are talking about different sets.
Why? Yeah, no, it's it's the same question. Yeah, it it does, but it's but but they could still be weak mixing, right? There are like weak mixing synthetic sets that are just totally uncorrelated with subgroup uh, with um, subgroups in F three omega because it's an infinite group. So you still have weak mixing, like weak mixing actions. You have mixing actions. There's Bernoulli actions. Yeah, but still, but it doesn't contain. They they still don't contain cosets of, of finite dimensional. They they still don't contain finite index subgroups. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Yeah. Thank you.